I'd like to carry on without any further ado by introducing Andreas Hildebrandt of ALC Networks, who is going to talk to us about Ravenna. All right. Good morning. Uh, my name is Andreas Hildebrandt. I am working for ALC uh, Networks uh, based in Munich. Uh, and we have developed the uh, Ravenna uh, IP-based router media network. And um, today I'm not going to talk too much about technical stuff. Um, I'm just a bit more explaining why Ravenna is there and uh, what our uh, strategy is to adopt Ravenna into the marketplace. And that probably will also make uh, clear why looking at the raw numbers, Roland uh, just presented um, before, um, gives a bit of a lack of, well, market um, uh, acceptance or maybe market um, uh, share of the uh, Ravenna products. <clears throat> First of all, we started in 2008, and I have to correct Mark on this, so Ravenna has not been introduced in 2007. Uh, we started on 2008 internally, it was not visible at that time. And our vision, our vision was to have a platform-independent context exchange technology. It shouldn't have been limited to audio, but also be visible uh, video. And so we had some requirements. As uh, Roland already mentioned, we strongly came from the uh, broadcasting direction. So naturally, in broadcasting, you have uh, uh, um, a fair amount of uh, requirements. I'm not talking about uh, scalability, it's fast, shareable, flexible, and so on. But um, the latter three are the most important uh, requirements we've uh, identified. It's uh, that it needs, needed to be routable because broadcast facilities usually uh, consist of large corporate network infrastructures which are not situated in a single isolated Ethernet segment or in a local area network. Um, solutions should be non-proprietary. So should we, uh, we had the requirement not to invent something on our own but use standards as far as possible, so it should be based on standards. So this is a sketch of the first vision we took when gathering together. I'm not going to explain this, but this is actually from the 2008. This was the first sketch when uh, we inaugurated the technology. Um, so when we dig into uh, the, uh, the technology, into audio networking uh, stuff, we were confronted with a lot of buzzwords, with a lot of technology words, and all these words actually created a lot of confusion to us. Maybe to you as well, I don't know, but that was our experience. So what are, what are we going to do about it? Well, what we did, of course, was a market evaluation. What was already out there? What were the needs of people? Um, what was being used? Where it has been used? Why is nothing existing for broadcast applications until then? And, of course, we also did a... Um, we did a technology assessment. So we were not just looking at the market and the uh, uh, solutions out there. We also were looking at what technologies are visible, or are present as of 2008. What could be a, a solution being made of? So we immediately decided the only thing we can go, the only basic platform we can go with is IP networking. Uh, why IP-based networking? Well, we don't have to uh, uh, talk about the general advantages networking was offering. Um, we have heard that uh, uh, from Mark before. So IP-specific is that IP is available. IP was an available technology, so a lot of network equipment was out there, infrastructures were readily available, and IP is a widely deployed technology. IP-based technology is based on standards. There are a lot of standard protocols out there, the Internet Protocol Suite, uh, um, and they are widely supported by network infrastructure. So that's another reason to go with IP-based uh, solution. Routing capability, as I mentioned, is a very important uh, requirement for broadcasting applications, also for other uh, larger installations. So we needed to have something routable and since Ethernet stays within the local area network segment, we needed to go IP, layer 3. Uh, convergence is of a big uh, requirement, uh, specifically in the broadcast environment, where you have hundreds, if not thousands, of PC, which do require connectivity to that audio network uh, one or the other way, without dedicated hardware uh, boards, just to the standard network interface. And uh, finally, <coughs> oops, sorry, finally... 
IP uh, was judged to be future-proof because all the, IP, the, the communication and telco companies were growing their services based on IP at that time. And, well, since then, a few years have been passed, and we all know that uh, even the standard telephone lines are going to be exchanged to IP uh, as of today, so future-proof. Um, so then there was a final question, actually. Can we take something existing and make it available for broadcast uh, requirements, for broadcast applications, or do we have to make something? So we had to look at the existing technology at that time. Um, so these were the technologies we identified. LiveWire has been introduced in 2003. Wheatnet IP is another American uh, company providing a, a network solution. Dante had been introduced in 2006. Then there was the uh, NASIB or ASIP scheme developed by the EBU, uh, was in existing since 2007. And AVB, well, has not been introduced in 2005. As we know, the latest standard protocol had been uh, uh, published, I guess, in 2011, um, but it was visible from 2005 on as it, it was originating from the residential Ethernet group. So it was already technology-wise visible uh, in the direction uh, could be seen. Now, then um, we had to judge if any of these technologies uh, could be applicable for just take them and um, uh, make an improvement to them to make them uh, matching the requirements in the broadcast industry. So from the technical perspective, we did an assessment on all these technologies and found that the only matching technology at that time was what Dante was promising, technology-wise, feature-wise. Um, and then we had to see, is any of these technologies openly available? Do they have a suitable business model which would, it make it possible, which would make it possible to apply it to broadcast applications and make it acceptable by manufacturers using it, that technology deep in their core. And we finally uh, came to this conclusion. And um, the whole assessment at the end uh, summarized in the decision, well, we have to make something. Because we just can't take either due to a non-matching technical specifications or because the business model or the... Um, openness does just not suit our requirements. So we decided to make something on our own. And it was in 2010 when Ravenna actually uh, saw the light of the world at the IBC in 2010. We introduced uh, Ravenna to the public. Um, I'm not going to tell you anything about the technology today, uh, at least not into a deep detail, just to, uh, to the features we had achieved with that uh, technology. It's a pure layer three based solution. So it runs purely on layer three, it does not uh, require any um, local area network specifics. Uh, thus it can operate on most of the existing network infrastructures already in place in corporate environments. Um, it can uh, run concurrent, uh, um, concurrently um, run different uh, media formats, sample rates, uh, like video and audio. It can run 48 kilohertz, 44, 192 kilohertz, 16-bit audio, compressed audio, everything is possible. And it allows phase-accurate distribution of media clocks. Well, distribution we learned by now, because we are employing precision time protocol, which uh, Mark introduced earlier. We know by now this is distributing time accurate time, and media clocks are actually derived from absolute time locally, but uh, with PTP we have the option of running, uh, of, of generating the uh, media clocks to a phase accurate um, precision as defined by AS11. Uh, it gives you the option of having full bit transparency with all media formats, so it does not um, include any compression requirements. And it's been designed uh, for serving applications with lowest latency requirements. The uh, application uh, with the lowest latency requirement, which comes into my mind, is the uh, in-ear monitoring live application. You need to have an end-to-end -end latency, which is uh, below two milliseconds, actually. So the transport technology with AD and DA conversion involved uh, would call for something which is certainly in the uh, below millisecond latency area and Ravenna can provide um, this requirement. And of course, since we use IP and standard networks, the capacity scales uh, with the underlying network infrastructure. If you have a gigabit link, you can run 500 channels of audio. If you improve the link bandwidth by adding more links or changing to 10 gigabit technology, the uh, number of channels uh, increases adequately. 
Um, it's routable since it's IP layer 3. We have built in a full network redundancy support if required. And the whole solution is based on already existing standards. We have not added any proprietary protocol uh, to the uh, Ravenna suite. And so we call the whole technology also open technology. We decided not to do a proprietary uh, technology and sell it as a license. We made it an open technology. What do we mean by open technology? First of all, first of all, <laughs> it's based on uh, technology which is already publicly available. So we don't have a proprietary black box design in there. It utilizes already existing standard protocols which have been in use um, uh, for some time before and uh, are proven and widely um, deployed. It's uh, designed to work on the existing network um, infrastructure, so no new network infrastructures are absolutely required to run Ravenna. And there's no proprietary licensing technology, uh, licensing uh, policy connected to Ravenna, so we don't have anything like cost per channel, um, uh, the cost per module or whatever. And so we can actually say Ravenna suits all uh, performance needs, be it a single channel microphone or a hundred channel console or even a thousand channel cross point switcher, and there's no licensing cost from our side involved. So before we published uh, Ravenna in 2010, um, we thought about how can we introduce this technology into the market. And it was clear from the very beginning if there's only just one manufacturer which would promote this technology, that would probably lead to nowhere. So we approached uh, a few well-known manufacturers in 2009 and asked them if they, what they think about what we were just suggesting to them. And this was Direct Out, Chubbs, Merging Technologies, and Ganelec and Lavo. And all these five manufacturers instantly agreed on having joint effort, joint development, joint marketing effort, and that resulted finally in the uh, publication of the Ravenna technology at IBC 2010. In 2011, we actually published the whole Ravenna uh, suite, um, uh, so it's available on the Ravenna website for free, so everybody can download it, and any man interested manufacturer can actually uh, make a Ravenna uh, implementation according to this um, published uh, framework. Um, and by now, uh, Ravenna is already supported by a lot of companies, and as Roland uh, mentioned, support is one thing, products uh, are another thing. Here's just a picture of uh, what companies are currently supporting Ravenna. Not all of them are uh, having, having products out there at the moment, lots of them are working on implementations uh, at the moment. So this was the landscape uh, just before 2014 with um, a few very important additions in 2014. And that were uh, American company Orban, Calrec, and uh, Finnish company uh, Utel. And we also have support from, and that's interesting, some infrastructure manufacturers which actually do not do a Ravenna implementations but are looking to make their infrastructure components which is uh, time grandmasters or switch manufacturers make the features such a technology requires available in their switches so make sure that the configurations mechanisms are in place to actually support a network like Ravenna or AS67 and that list certainly is growing so but all of that is not nothing worth if not products would be available. And as you have seen, there are not so many products as with uh, Dante, for example, uh, which is certainly um, not just um, contributed to the marketplace, to the primary marketplace we are in, but also to the timeline. Uh, so it just takes some time for manufacturers to implement an open standard, an open technology into their products uh, if they uh, are not restricted to just buy a module which looks like an audio interface uh, to the uh, to the internal uh, uh, system. So manufacturers have to do a bit more work to implement Ravenna into their products than just buying a simple module. So this is just a um, um, not a full palette of products, but just to give you an idea how different uh, products with Ravenna implementations are currently. We have sound cards. We have a commentary system, we have uh, high quality I.O. converters, uh, these low quality, forgive me about saying low quality, low, it's not low quality, it's, uh, it's low 
channel count IO nodes, we have MADI IO stuff here, and we have software based applications as well. Newest additions were from merging technology the uh, HAPI, which is a slimline, the son of Horus, a slimline IO interface. Um, direct out has a Ravenna to MADI converter, which features um, four MADI ports to Ravenna ports, and we have the D DMI8 from Neumann, which is an eight channel digital microphone interface. Roland, I know that is still not the microphone with the RJ45 plug at the end you're looking for, but at least it's a microphone uh, um, interface for a Ravenna network. Um, and of course, there's a whole range of Lava products which also have. Um, uh, Ravenna inside. So it's, uh, the, it's the mixing consoles, the software applications, the big routing engines, all these already have Ravenna or can be added with uh, Ravenna cards to make existing systems which are already deployed also Ravenna capable. So fields of application for Ravenna. Actually, as I said, the uh, primary focus was on broadcasting. So we started out of the broadcasting world. That was a justification to actually uh, um, develop the Ravenna technology. So Ravenna can be used for all tasks which usually um, relate to audio distribution within broadcasting facilities, in-house, inter-facility link, uh, wide area connectivity, uh, OB vans, all this kind of stuff. With wide area connectivity, of course, these wide area network uh, connections need to qualify to the requirements to actually run um, Ravenna on it, so it's not the internet, and that's why we say not challenging the codec applications. The codec applications running the ASA protocol are usually what you, what you use. Uh, if you have a wacky wide area network connectivity like satellite links, the internet, DSL, whatever, so that's certainly something Ravenna cannot run on. Others applica other applications we see for the technology is uh, of course in the install market, in the venue event installation where we have large sports events. The live market and also recording NMI is certainly uh, applicable for Ravenna technology. It just needs the products in these areas. And well, the good news is there are already uh, companies uh, developing uh, products or uh, OEM parts for products, which could then also uh, host Ravenna or AS67 technology for those uh, respective market markets. Some example applications where Ravenna uh, is already being deployed, and these are just a few examples here to give you the, uh, the broad uh, possibility uh, where Ravenna can be used. We have an uh, installation in Germany in the public state broadcaster, ARD. We have 35 journalist edit suites. Each edit suite consists of two Jade PCs, which both host a Jade interface. And they connect through Jade, uh, through a Ravenna interface. Um, uh, they connect through Ravenna to a Lavo Crystal desktop, and all these 35 edit suites are also uh, interconnected by Ravenna. Um, during the uh, FIFA World Championship in Brazil, um, Ravenna has been used in more than 240 Lavo commentary units. So there was a live. Uh, event where Ravenna was um, used as uh, to transport the uh, commentary feeds uh, to the central uh, system. We had a remote production studio from ARD uh, ZDF um, sitting at the Copacabana, which was connected to the International Broadcasting Center a few kilometers away, where Ravenna was uh, employed, and various OB vans in the games uh, also had some Ravenna installations aboard. Um, then on the commercial side, interestingly enough, since April, there is a pilot uh, project running where we have a UTEL Hitman system. Um, that's an audio engine system which utilizes the Ravenna virtual sound card provided by us. And it connects to 40 Genelec IP speakers uh, running Ravenna. So that project is um, running since April as a commercial installation in Finland. And finally, not to forget our friends from uh, Merging Technologies who are heavily involved in recording. So they have numerous mobile and fixed recording installations uh, featuring the Pyramix uh, digital audio workstation, Horus and Happy I.O. interfaces, and also the uh, core audio uh, Mac driver uh, for recording stuff into a Mac with Ravenna. Just an excerpt of what is uh, actually going on with the Ravenna applications. And finally, in 2010, work started 
And it uh, took until 2013, you guys worked well, the X192 workgroup started in 2010, end or late 2010, and the result was the AES 67 standard, which has been published um, at the end of 2013. And uh, of course, um, uh, not just us, but also other Ravenna partners were heavily involved in that work. And um, even, uh, you could say, well, a lot of guys came from the Ravenna community supporting that work. It was more than 100 individuals from the industry, not just manufacturers, but also from the broadcasters. BBC was heavily involved, Swedish radio, and even uh, people from the live market. So there was a, a good mixture of pro-audio uh, experts, and um, they started to do just pretty much the same we did a few years ago, a technology assessment, a market um, research, and they came across... Uh, basically the same technologies as Ravenna was already being built, and that's the reason why Ravenna already supports the AS67 standard from the very beginning when it was published. Um, so, a few words on the AS67 standard. That could be a whole other topic of presentation. I'm not going too deep into it, but just to give you uh, an idea. The uh, scope of AS67 actually is now, interoperability guidelines provide interoperability guidelines for professional low latency audio over campus or local area networks using existing protocols wherever possible. So, first of all, that excludes non IP networking, so it's an IP based scheme. Low bandwidth media is excluded, so if we don't have enough bandwidth, we can't run AS67. Data compression is excluded. And low performance vans and uh, public internet, well, by nature, is also excluded. And since it's an audio standard, video is also not part of the game. But the basis, how AS67 had been defined, can make it uh, usable or useful for video transport as well, which is just the same for Ravenna, uh, of course. Now, emphasis has to be put on that it's interoperability guidelines and it should reuse existing protocols wherever possible. So A67 at the end is not a solution on its own, and it's not, the target was not to invent yet another audio networking protocol system. So um, when we looked at the existing uh, systems at that time, we had the LiveWire, Wittner, Dante, NASIP schemes, uh, which you already have seen uh, before. Ravenna was in existing at that time. The QLAN system was in existence. And AVB at that time was in existence, or close to existence, because we already knew what uh, the final missing pieces, uh, which were not published at the end of 2010, would look like. So we were looking at these technologies, and as you can see, in the two last columns, that although they were all based on IP, they either have different mechanisms for synchronization or transport or other subtle differences um, which prohibited us, us uh, talking about the X102 work group, to actually define a subset which was applicable immediately to all of the applications. So actually we had to run through all the individual available technologies, protocols, again, and uh, define something which would make it possible for the existing technologies to adopt to AS67 with the least possible effort. I'm not going to explain what the technology is all about, just to give you a few um, uh, hints. We needed to cover synchronization and local media clock generation. All this is done by uh, precision time protocol, by absolute time distribution. Uh, we needed to cope with the uh, uh, network layer and the transport protocols, so we identified IP version 4 as um, the layer to work on with some um, provisions to make it possible to adopt to IP version 6 later on. And transport protocol natively was based on RTP because that is what is already being used, uh, widely used by most of the applications and also by other streaming technologies. Then we needed to discuss um, uh, the uh, payload format, the encoding and the packet setup. Uh, we came uh, across 16 and 24-bit linear, which needed to be supported by uh, at 48 kilohertz. 
And uh, the packet setup um, was um, defined to be 48 samples as a mandatory format, which uh, translates into a one millisecond packetization. So in other words, each packet contains one millisecond of audio. Now this is not the best possible performance you can get, uh, but it's a good compromise between requirements on one side and support by all the other technologies on the other side. Remember, we were not to define a totally new networking scheme. We were always closely looking at the already existing technologies. What are they using? What are they supporting? And so that's, that's the outcome, how uh, it had been defined. Quality of service needs to be in place. Uh, in contrast to AVB, where uh, uh, quality of service, namely the uh, bandwidth reservation and uh, the uh, traffic shaping, is uh, part of the standard, part of the new AVB internet, Ethernet standard, which requires switches supporting this. Uh, we didn't want to make something new um, which is not supported by the existing equipment. So we were looking at what is available and differentiated services as a quality of service mechanism is widely deployed and available. And so we were naturally using that one to make sure that the uh, AS67 packets get preferred um, uh, forwarding through the network switches. Connection management is part of the um, AS67 suite and the only thing actually missing to make it a complete solution at the end is discovery. Um, discovery has been excluded because there were so many different possibilities out there and uh, in the uh, expert group, we were not able to actually conclude on one scheme. Uh, and we also, uh, at the end, found out that it's wise not to have discovery actually included in here because it's not actually needed for interoperability. In order to exchange streams, discovery is not needed. Think of your old telephone system. You can make a telephone call to anywhere in the world. You just need to know the number. Does your telephone automatically give you the zillions of telephone numbers out there once you uh, uh, switch the telephone on? No. There's an external discovery and directory service, and that's just the same philosophy behind AS67. All the technology pieces you need to really exchange the streams are in place, but you need to know what's the address of my stream, where can I get the stream data from. And that is what uh, comes with discovery, and that makes the big difference from uh, AS67 compared to any of the other existing systems like LiveWire, Dante, Ravenna, which all include discovery schemes. Unfortunately, they all build on different schemes, and so discovery is an open part. The good news is discovery is not just needed for stream interconnectivity, but also for system control, for, for, for parameter functionality, for everything else. And so this is a field of standardization where it would not have been wise to fix a certain discovery scheme for AES67 and then suddenly came up with something different for just parameter control. So we feel that discovery is a separate topic and it can well apply to AES67 as well as to other uh, functional areas typically used in a full system. So that's a uh, brief overview of AES67 technology. So somebody called AS67 the zero negative of audio networking. That somebody uh, happened to be among us. That's Roland Hemming, who we just heard before. So AS67, the zero negative of audio networking. Any clue? Any idea? Well, think of blood groups. Zero negative is the optimum donor for all the existing blood groups out there. So AS67 is the optimum interoperability um, definition for all the other networking solutions out there. This, just as an example, could look like this. Um, this is a bit, uh, basically the same picture Roland already provided, just with a more illustrative uh, approach. We have a stadium uh, which may have a Dante installation in there. We have another stadium which may have a QLAN installation in there. And then we have a local broadcaster coming up. If it's coming up, well, I know the traffic jam in London is really bad, so it comes up. <laughs> oh, well, and maybe we should not use that one. We should have a, a more modern one, this one. That may have a Ravenna board. Now, what happens if you try to connect with the OB van to the um, venues? Well, it doesn't work because Ravenna and Dante don't talk, Ravenna and QSIS don't talk. And here's uh, where AS67 comes into the game. You just 
set up those streams which need to be exchanged in AS67 format without changing um, the Dante installation in the venue or the Ravenna installation in the OB event. Just set AS67 up for those streams you really want to access and then you can, ha uh, can have them uh, vice or versa uh, in the venues or in the OB event. You might have a uh, native connectivity from the OB van to the um, central broadcasting house. You might also have an ASIP connection to a regional or remote studio. And as uh, AS67 has made some provisions that an ASIP device is enabled to receive an AS67 stream, you can at least distribute uh, whatever is being produced into the uh, remote radio station using the ASIP codex or the ASIP codec protocol. That's the idea how AS67 can or could potentially be applied uh, to um, real applications. Question is, uh, of course, when will it be available? Well, um, with Ravenna, it's already available now. And uh, how is that? Well, basically, um, that, is, that illustrates the upcoming um, scheme. We have AS67. AS67 covers definitions for synchronization, media clock generation, network transport, encoding packet setup, QoS, connection management, just as a repetition from what you learned before. So this is all covered by AS67. Ravenna actually covers the whole scheme but gives more options on media clocks, formats, on packet setup, on latency, quality of service, and it includes discovery and redundancy. So basically, Ravenna, for Ravenna, AES67 is just an already existing native operational mode. Nothing needed to be changed to fully support AES67. For those of you who are deep into the technology, yes, there's one protocol which actually was not part of the Ravenna suite before. This is the SIP connection management. But SIP as a connection management protocol can easily be added to any of the Ravenna uh, uh, implementations on top for making AS67 uh, uh, full compatibility happen. And um, actually, to prove that, the first AS67 plug fest just has happened six weeks ago at the <coughs> IRT in Munich. Uh, you can see Mark in front of the audience. And uh, we had three and a half day of plugging with uh, 22 participants um, that were 10 manufacturers and uh, people from IRT, EBU and Swedish radio who were mm -hmm. observing and helping, uh, diagnosing, um, uh, helping on diagnosis and analyzing. We had 16 products uh, under test, uh, out of them 15 were uh, based on uh, Ravenna implementation or were already supporting Ravenna. And we, of course we had lots of streams which we were sending around in millions of packets uh, which we saw on the network, not each individual packet of course was analyzed but uh, we could make sure that um, uh, interoperability actually happened. The test we run um, included synchronization. Of course, without synchronization, no interoperability uh, could have been possible. So we, uh, our first test included uh, the synchronization part of AS67. Then we were running concurrent uh, multicast streams between all nodes uh, with a mandatory stream format being defined in AS67. So at first we were just sending out one stream per node and made sure it could be received by all the other devices just by providing AS67 means. And then um, a second stage, we were flooding the network with lots of multicast streams from uh, the individual devices, even multiple streams from one device, and everything went smooth as well. And uh, we also conducted some tests on unicast streaming and SIP connection setup, but since uh, uh, when we called for the plug fest, we were clearly focusing on uh, the first stage of interoperability based on synchronization and multicast. Not all devices were already participating in the unicast or SIP connectivity setup. However, at the end, we could prove that the basics of AS67 are laid out uh, in a way that interoperability could be provided and it had been successfully demonstrated at the end of the day. A report, by the way, is being, uh, is being made available by the AES. Mark, is that publicly available? Or? Um, it's generally available. It's on the AES um, standard store. It's called AES R12, and it's permanently available. If anybody needs a copy, let me know if you can't get it through the normal channels. All right. Final slide to close up. So what finally is Ravenna? 
Ravenna is like a cookbook. It's called Ravenna Draft and Operational Principles. Like every good cookbook, it has a list of ingredients. So you have to have PTP, version 2, RTP, a bit of multicast, and um, bonjour on top of it. And the cookbook also includes the um, cooking order. Here's the cooking order coming up. So you have to base your recipe on PTP, then add the streaming transport to it, mingle with multicast and add bonjour to um, actually make it discoverable, serve hot and enjoy. And the good thing about Ravenna, it already has a 67 inside and it's publicly available on the Ravenna website. I guess uh, questions are not part of uh, this session. They are coming up uh, after the next presentation. That's correct. And so um, it's just five minutes. It's not as bad as Thomas Gottschalk, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks, Andreas. <laughs>